There is always a lot of meaning that can be derived from music, but the depth of that meaning is often debatable, ranging from epic ballads about adventure and the hero's journey to simple songs about fast cars and getting booty. And one such budding rock star was so mad and so anti-authoritarian that he managed to achieve infamy by simply blowing people away with his smile. Look, Helder, the smiley face bomber. But before we get into the mad lad, this episode is brought to you by Raycon. Raycon are shaking up the electronics industry by offering premium wireless audio for half of the price. Their earbuds come in a range of fun colours and patterns with no annoying dangling wires and a 45 day free return policy. The company was co-founded by Ray J and has been endorsed by celebrities like Snoop Dogg, Mike Tyson and Rich the Kid. Raycon earbuds have 6 hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass and a compact design that gives you a noise isolating fit. All activities are better with music, so click my link in the description to get 15% off of your order at buyraycon.com slash dankula. Luke Helder was born on the 5th of May 1981 in the small town of Pine Island, Minnesota. His father was a commander of the local American Legion post and his mother worked in a health clinic. Just before graduating from high school in 1998, Luke allegedly threatened to blow up his friend's mailbox. Juvenile records are sealed however so we can't know for sure whether he did or not. But I think we might be able to make a good guess later. He studied art and industrial design at the University of Wisconsin Stout and although he didn't really excel academically, teacher said that he was quiet, polite and generally a reasonably good student that was attentive in class and unafraid to debate and challenge ideas when appropriate. Despite mostly keeping to himself, in the year 2000 he along with two friends formed a three-piece grunge band named Apathy, where he played guitar and lead vocals alongside Mike Stanton playing drums and Eric Heilscher on bass. Luke greatly admired Kurt Cobain and was described as having an interesting style of singing by Stanton. The band was actually quite successful on the local level and they even self-funded and released a CD at the end of their first summer together and this CD was called Sacks of People. But unfortunately in one store in Rochester that sells CDs from local bands they actually ended up giving away the copies because they didn't sell. But money wasn't actually everything to these guys because these guys just enjoyed playing music. And here's a bit from one of their songs called Conformity. It's a time when, when the pain comes, a never-ending trend. Then we go away from everything that Eric Heilscher said that this wasn't really their best work because it was recorded when they were still trying to find their voice. But it sounds pretty innocuous, doesn't it? Just your 
standard grunge song from a college band. Like most students his age, Luke wasn't a huge fan of the government and he was known to say that he was sick of it controlling people. Relatable. In October of 2001, Luke received a citation and a $151 fine from the cops for possession of a marijuana pipe and when he was being given the citation he asked the officer is this what the government is for? Man, a student got caught with weed. <laughs> Say it ain't so. But other than that, there was nothing out of the ordinary about Luke at all. His teachers liked him, his friends liked him, and Mike Stanton described him as an average, kind of quiet, nice guy. But it's always the quiet ones that cause all the trouble, isn't it? Unlike most students his age, he began to rage against the machine a bit too hard, and he started acting strangely. He bought a mobile phone and started carrying around hundreds of dollars in cash, and he left a note for his roommate saying that he was blowing off work to go to a party in Madison. And then the roommate got a message saying that Luke wouldn't be home for the next two nights and that he was to check the news and act accordingly. Naturally, these messages and behaviours were strange and didn't make sense at all until this happened. 18 pipe bombs were found in mailboxes across the country between the 3rd and 6th of May 2002 with the first eight being found around Iowa and Illinois. And six of these bombs had actually exploded when the mailboxes were opened. And six people were injured, four of whom were mail carriers. As you would expect, grisly hand injuries and hearing loss were common among the victims, though very luckily no one died. The rest of the bombs were found in Nebraska and Colorado, with the last bomb being found in Amarillo, Texas. Luckily, no other bombs, apart from the initial six, had exploded. The bombs themselves were stuffed with metal ball bearings and nails, which is pretty standard for such devices. But what was interesting about the packages was the letters that accompanied them. These letters contained rants denouncing the government and described the bombs as attention getters, with one of the letters saying, the United States strives to provide freedom for their people, but do we really have personal freedom? I've lived here for many years and I see much limitation. Do you people enjoy this trend of limitation? If not, change it. Now, I am all for activism and peaceful protest against the government to try and limit the government's ever-increasing power. But not like this, though. No, 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 no. Not like this. Naturally, the bombings received a lot of coverage in the media as the country was still on edge from 9-11 and prior anthrax attacks. And for a while after the bombings, the US Postal Service recommended that people prop open their mailboxes and in some places, mailmen just didn't deliver for a while. And I really don't blame them. Luke sent his father, Cameron Helder, a letter that said that mailboxes were exploding. And along with this letter, he also included a six-page manifesto that was also sent to his university's newspaper, the Badger Herald. The manifesto contains your standard government bad, we live in a society ramblings, but also a bunch of cosmic big brain stuff about astral projection, meditation, out of body experiences, and also how the government and religions use the myth of death to control you through fear of mortality. Yes, you heard that correctly. Luke believes that we are immortal, spiritual entities 
and that death does not exist. Well then, where's my gran? Around the same time, Luke's college roommate called Luke's parents to tell them about a bag that he found under Luke's bed. A bag that contained bits of pipe, a bag of nails, a funnel and black powder residue. Though devastated by the realisation of what their son had done, Luke's parents did the right thing and called the authorities. And while his dad was giving public statements pleading for his son to come home and not to harm anyone else, the chase was on. While on the run, Luke slipped up badly by switching on his phone and calling his parents, who then immediately handed the phone to an FBI agent. They then traced his phone to somewhere between Battle Mountain and Golconda in rural Nevada, and it wasn't long before the cops were on his trail. And to make matters even worse for Luke, a motorist spotted his car on Interstate 80 and notified the authorities. Ultimately, Luke never made it to the West Coast as he was arrested 50 miles east of Reno, Nevada on the 7th of May 2002 after a brief car chase and the intervention of a hostage negotiator because when the feds caught up with Luke, he put a shotgun to his own head. I did say he was a Kurt Cobain fan. Nah. That joke only works if it was actually Kurt Cobain who did it. Luckily, this derivative and on-the-nose display ended with Luke tossing the shotgun out of the window. Bomb squads then found another gun and six more bombs in his car. They also interrogated him about the locations of the bombs. And it turns out that the locations were not random. They were specifically chosen for a certain reason. It was so that when you marked out the locations of all the explosion sites on a map, it, it would make a smiley face. That, that, that was the reason for the locations that he chose. He wanted to send a message to the government by killing a bunch of innocent people, but I think he also wanted to make it fun, I guess. But if Luke was supposed to be going east to complete his smiley face, then why was he found so far west? Why did he just leave his big project incomplete after what would have been a lot of preparation? Well, it was because he apparently wanted to see the Pacific Ocean one last time. So he just jumped in his dad's Honda Accord and headed west. And he was actually stopped for speeding three times on the way there. If only, if only at least one of those officers asked to search his trunk. Despite the shotgun to the head suicide threat as he was being apprehended and being put on suicide watch, Luke was remarkably chilled out. However, despite the police describing him as affable, polite and responsive, he was held without bail until being transferred to Iowa and he wasn't turned over to his parents out of concern that he would be a flight risk or a danger to others. They didn't actually have to worry about Luke killing himself though because in his manifesto he said that individuals who commit suicide for the purpose of escaping their problems get out of their bodies because remember we are immortal spiritual beings only to find themselves contaminated with the same sadness and they often find themselves even more confused. As if it's possible for someone like Luke to be any more confused. I very much prefer the motto, suicide is a permanent solution to temporary problems. So don't even think about it.
On the 5th of June, 2002, Luke was charged in Iowa with using an explosive to maliciously destroy property, resulting in injury to a person and possession of a pipe bomb during a federal crime. Similar charges were also filed in Nebraska and Illinois. And obviously, Luke was facing life in prison just with the Iowa charges. But he pleaded not guilty. Luke actually seemed weirdly at ease during his indictment. And he even smiled at his parents and while talking to his lawyer several times. The judge said that it was apparent that Luke suffered from mental health problems and after a delay in the trial, Luke eventually pleaded insanity. The trial was then delayed even further as experts conducted mental evaluations on Luke. But then the trial was postponed indefinitely on the 1st of April 2003. Finally, on the 1st of April 2004, Luke was declared incompetent to stand trial. After three reports by doctors, he was sent to the Federal Medical Centre in Rochester, Minnesota to undergo psychiatric evaluation to determine whether Luke was a risk to others or not. Luke was committed after being diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder which caused grandiose feelings and put Luke under the delusion that he was morally obligated to enlighten others about his views. Therefore, he was unfit to stand trial as he didn't understand the proceedings, which would have explained why he was so relaxed during his hearing. Eventually, years went by and a federal judge ordered Luke to be re-evaluated to determine if his mental health had improved enough for him to stand trial for his crimes, and this was attempted in 2006 and then again in 2013. Despite the charges against him being dropped in Nebraska and Iowa's Southern District, he is still facing being put away for the rest of his life in the event that he becomes of sound enough mind to have the book thrown at him. News of Luke potentially standing trial actually provoked a pretty mixed reaction among his victims. A letter carrier that needed surgery in his arm after a piece of shrapnel tore through it said that he's put the whole event behind him, while the husband of one of the women that were injured in Iowa said that Luke is guilty as hell of everything and that he ought to serve some time for it. He also doubted that an insanity plea wouldn't work because, and I quote, he couldn't have been too insane because he put a lot of thought into it. Fair. But ultimately, that's for the judge to decide and to this day, Luke is still being treated in the Federal Medical Centre. Everyone that knew Luke was actually quite shocked that such a laid back and generally nice person would do something like this. One of his own professors at his university even said that she didn't actually want it to be him and that he was, and I quote, almost sweet. You think you know a guy? Members of other bands said that Apathy wasn't even the most political band in the area at the time and the band's drummer said that while he never paid much attention to the lyrics of their songs, <laughs> typical drummer, he said that he never noticed anything particularly egregious. It's the general consensus that pretty much everyone in the music scene was anti-government, at least on some level. They just preferred to blow out speakers instead of mailboxes. It just seems that Luke decided to take it a little bit further and thought he was Johnny Silverhand. Unfortunately, Luke's musical background renewed the debate around the effects of rock and roll on the youth, and the media focused heavily on the fact that Luke was in a band when reporting on the bombings. Tipper Gore was probably foaming at the mouth with excitement to find out that when Luke was arrested, 
he was wearing a Kurt Cobain t-shirt. Rock music causes violence and it's turning our kids into radicals. We still hear the same arguments like that today, except it's over spicy memes. You know, that meme was so funny that I completely forgot that murder's bad. The focus on rock and roll instead of Luke just being severely mentally unwell even resulted in the media requesting copies of Apathy's CD, leading to it becoming so highly sought after by music critics that copies ended up being sold on eBay for $200 a piece. I bet that record store wished they never gave them away now. Apathy's own website also shut down because of the sheer flood of traffic to it after the FBI identified Luke. And the more I think about it, the more the band name Apathy seems apt, considering how Luke couldn't even be bothered finishing his own terrorist plot. Obviously, Luke wasn't radicalised by music or anything like that. And the only person to blame for the bombings was Luke himself. Ultimately, he was just a mentally ill kid whose strange behaviour didn't get noticed until it was too late. And this sentiment was reflected in the emotional statements made by Luke's dad, where he asked for understanding. He's quoted as saying, I really want you to know that Luke is not dangerous. I think he is only trying to make a statement on how the government is being run. He has ideas and no one was listening to him. I know that he loves his son and I know that he doesn't want the world thinking that he's a monster, but not dangerous. He blew people up. Before we finish, I would like to offer a, a quick word of advice, a, a moral of the story, if you will. If you have a belief or a great revelation that you want to put out there, no matter how important you think it is to spread this idea, don't hurt people to do it. Because all you are doing is making sure that no one will ever take you seriously and people, instead of listening to your idea, will instead associate your idea with violence. By using violence to spread your idea, you aren't helping your idea, you're actually destroying it. I know that we are all huge fans of freedom of speech here on this channel, so by all means, spread your message far and wide. Just do so without, you know, killing people. It's, it's not that hard. It's, re it's really not that hard. And as you do so, just remember to put on a happy face. Oh, I'm going to get into trouble again. It's Count Dankula on YouTube. Everybody says subscribe.